Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, you can open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and um, get ready. We're going to look at a few verses here pertaining to the Lord's Supper Day. We observe communion the first Sunday of every month. Uh, we don't really, haven't really preached on communion uh, much or the Lord's Supper. And so, uh, being in, kind of in between series this, uh, this week, I thought it might be a good time to just kind of take a look at this text and, and see what God's Word says. And so... Um, let's just go ahead and re read the text together. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 11. This is Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth, who we know, uh, you know, or maybe you do or don't know. They were they were a church a lot like us, just a lot of uh, no good for nothings, you know, trying to live for Jesus. So, uh, but anyway, uh, they needed a lot of correction, and and this is one of the things that that Paul gave them here. He said, "For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you." that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body need, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Let's pray together. Father, this is your word. And, uh, Lord, we know today uh, that uh, you are here, your presence is here. And uh, so, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be free to uh, prick our hearts and um, help us to understand your truth. And, uh, Lord, today, just to reveal that to us, God, that we might walk in your ways. Lord, unite us as one in the body of Christ, as, as you are one in, in three. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, about a week or so ago, um, I can't remember exactly what night it was, but um, we were we went to Knoxville for uh, a banquet, an area banquet for some of the academic honors, and and Ivy and and uh, Brianna and Bailey and maybe one or two others from Sweetwater was up there, and we were sitting at a table with uh, the couple of guidance counselors from Sweetwater High School and. And it was it was a uh, you know a uh, fancy setting you know you know what I'm saying crystal uh, cu uh, glasses and you know and, and three or four three or four forks <laughs> three or four forks you know a couple of spoons and knives and you know and so we had we had fun with it but but um, you know I, uh, maybe it's hard for some of y'all to believe but I have not been to refining school and um, you know. I, 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 I've been told you work outside in, but there was one fork there that was, I just thought was extra. I thought, well, you know, and, and so I just said, well, what do we do with this? And, and uh, you know, it turned, it turned pretty ugly, and uh, we probably embarrassed the city of Sweetwater up there that night. But, but, um, but anyway, we had fun. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, there's lots of times when you go somewhere, you know, out to eat, and, you know, there, you, there's different expectations and, and, and things like that. And, and we probably stepped over the line a little bit up there the other night, but and I, and I think it's the same way really when we come together to observe the Lord's Supper, and that's one of the things you know the Corinthians had really messed up on. Um, you know, we like to have our fellowship meal after our worship and after we observe the Lord's Supper because I think that's a big part of what communion is about. It's a time for us to come together in our faith in Jesus. To make things right with him and to make things right with one another and to encourage us on to the task that he's given us and uh one of one of the things when god gave me the vision for the fellowship church that i thought was missing 
in a lot of traditional churches is that tight-knit community of fellowship where believers live together, they work together, and they, they do things daily with one another, meeting together. And, um, you know, that's something I think that, that we're really missing. Because you know, a lot of churches I've been a part of uh, and been pastor of, you know, you, you got people that drive in from long distances a lot of times and and um, you know the only time they ever see each other is at church and sometimes they don't even get a chance to speak to one another then and we're supposed to be a spiritual family anyway there's a lot of things tied in here but I want us to go back this morning and I want us to, to take a look at a few things now we're, we can't we're not looking at everything here but there's three instructions really here that I think we should follow when we observe the Lord's Supper, if we're going to do it right. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, it seems like we, we, you know, it's just tacked on to the end of a service or whatever, and, and we rush through it. You know, I try to always make sure that everybody uh, has a moment to reflect and do all the things we need to do. Uh, and I think it's important for us to observe it on, our, on a regular basis. The Bible says, you know, even more as the, we see the day approaching, um, but today, let's just take a look at these three instructions before we observe this meal. And uh, hopefully it can align our hearts with God and with one another. And uh, today, God will be pleased with this time of worship. So number one, the first instruction that Paul, that Paul gives here, really it comes from Jesus. But it, you know, this, this meal is a time for commemoration. I have the alliteration, so all of them start with C. I would have probably just said, it's a time to remember. Okay, so if you want to write that one down. It's a time to remember, a time to look back. And um, when you look at verses 23 through 25 here, you know, Jesus, um, he was observing the Passover meal with the disciples. Y'all know that, because every time we observe the Lord's Supper, I always remind you that that's where it came from, that Jesus was observing Passover with his disciples. And he, they gave thanks, and he broke the, the bread. And look at verses 24 and 25. And both, both times when he talks about the bread and the cup, he ends both of them saying to do this in remembrance of me. And so, you know, most of the time when uh, somebody we really love, when they pass away, um, you know, we don't like to think about that a lot. You know, we kind of like to try to dismiss that. And, uh, but Jesus asked us to remember Him. And to remember how He died. Because this, this is a memorial really about how He died. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it's easy a lot of times when we come together and we have the meal for us to, you know, consciously, I guess, think about the sacrifice of Jesus, His blood and, and His body and how He lived and how He died. Uh, but but uh, a lot of times I think it's easy for us to just kind of dismiss that as something less than it really was. And I think I think we, we do that a lot in, you know, in, in, in our uh, culture and have for centuries really because, you know, when you, when you look at the art of Jesus on the cross and, and uh, you know, even most of the movies, you know, uh, there, it, it doesn't nearly depict the, the pain and suffering that he went through. Mel Gibson's uh, The Passion, I think, is probably the one that most closely would represent the agony. You know, and most of y'all have probably seen that. If you're not, I recommend it. You know, it, it, I think it's biblically pretty accurate, and, and I think uh, the imagery is probably pretty accurate, but I, probably more gruesome than that. I mean, you know, you think about Christ. And, you know, He lived the perfect life in our place. And a lot of times, I think we forget that. But when He hung on Calvary's cross, He suffered the wrath of God for our sin. God, the Father, poured out all the punishment due to you and me upon Jesus on the cross. What we deserved, He took. And what we did not deserve, He gave to us. Right? He took our sin upon Him, which He did not deserve. 
And then He gave us His grace, which we do not deserve. And so, when we think about that, think about uh, uh, the suffering, you know, the, the wrath of God, not just for you and me, but for the sin of the whole world. The Bible says that that he, he, you know he 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 made um, in, or, <laughs> think of the word that when Jesus died he, um, he he suffered not for our sin not for our sins only John wrote not just for the apostles not just for the people of that age but for the sins of the whole world he paid, he paid the propitiation for our sins it was an appeasement it, it's a it was it was the only way that God could be satisfied. Because of our sin and accept us. It's the only way. You know, uh, I've, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, uh, you know, I can't believe that, you know, God would send His Son. That, that's, you know, one of the things the Muslims talk about how, oh, God has no Son. Uh, you know, uh, but, but, you know, it was, if there had been any other way for us to be redeemed from our sin, <laughs> don't you think God would have done that? I mean, if there had been a way for us to live without sin, and, and, and you know, and God says, okay, those of you who live without sin, y'all come on in, uh, and those of you who can't, you know, you're going to be condemned. Don't you think that would have been what He would have done? I mean, I hate to speculate about God. But what I'm trying to tell you is uh, that Jesus Christ and His suffering on Calvary's cross is the only way to be made right and acceptable to God. And that's what we need to remember. That's one of the things we need to remember when we take this meal. Think about the suffering of the Son of God for your sins. Go back and read Leviticus and read some of the penalties for your <coughs> sin. Just read through it sometime. And, you know, maybe, maybe you might not want to do this, but maybe you highlight the ones that are yours and the punishments. I would have been killed time and time again. I'm telling you, you know, I mean, the, the punishments uh, are pretty, pretty cruel, you know. Uh, but that's how serious sin is to God. And, 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 and so, this meal is a memorial. It's a time for us to remember the broken body and blood of Christ. And so it's different from all other meals because, you know, we don't come just to consume for our stomachs. And that's one of the things the Corinthians were doing. You know, they were coming, they were getting drunk, they were getting full. And, you know, it's just a party. And it is a party, but it's, it's a different kind of party in a way. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, 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 you know, we come instead to remember the outpouring of Jesus' blood to forgive our sins and to make a way for us to spend eternity with Him in all of God's glory. That's what it's about. And so we need to remember, uh, it's a, it, you know, every, every year of the fourth Thursday in uh, November, and our nation sets aside this day to remember, don't we? We set aside this day, we call it Thanksgiving Day, to remember the thankfulness or to commemorate the thankfulness to God for a bountiful harvest uh, that was shown by some of uh, you know our first settlers in, in this new land, and so uh, it's similar when we when we observe the Lord's Supper. It's a it's a far greater memorial. It's you know it's a memorial to remember the death of God's only Son to give us a freedom far greater than the freedoms we have had and still have here in the good old USA. It's freedom from sin and all of its consequences. That's what Christ has done for us. And so when we come to the table of the Lord, we should remember to remember Jesus and His suffering in our place. We should think of the death and the sacrifice of Christ and, and what that means for us. And let's remember the love of God as He poured it out on Calvary. And, let, and that ought to spur us on to love and obedience. So, Number one, it's a time of commemoration. Number two, another thing we should remember, another instruction 
uh, when we uh, partake of this meal, is we need to remember it's a time of consecration. And so what, what do we mean by that? Well, if, if we look at these verses here, um, you know, I, I think they help us understand this a little bit. So I, I want to... I I want to share something. This might be kind of gross, so, you know, I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, i got to go with what I come up with. You know, I mean, my mind's not as powerful as some of y'all's probably. But, but from time to time, you know, when we go out and eat or wherever, um, you know, I, before, before we eat, we try to wash our hands, right? I mean, we go to the restroom, wash our hands, and, you know, we try to teach the kids to do that. And, there have been times, you know, even when I've been in a group, you know, and, and I'm with people and I've seen guys, you know, go in, use the restroom and walk out without washing their hands. And I'm like, you know, note, please don't shake hands later, right? Uh, you know, but anyway, uh, you know, that's kind of what I'm thinking, but I'm just like, okay. Uh, you know, and they, they go sit down and eat and, and I'm just like, okay. But listen, just a little bit of practical stuff here. Just kind of give you the illustration. Did you know that you put yourself at risk for disease when you don't wash your hands after you go to the restroom. Did you know that? Uh, you know, I Googled this. I mean, you know, common illnesses, common illnesses that you can get, one of them is hand, foot, and mouth disease. Anybody want that? No. You know, but, but that's one of the most common. Another one is um, hepatitis A. You know, you can get that. And, and then the, probably one of the most familiar, but the hardest to pronounce, is Giardi, Giardi, I mean Giardia. Okay, I'm just gonna do it that way. I, I, it's got an I S I S I S like Mississippi kind of on the end of it. Giardiasis or something like that. But anyway, you know that that that's uh, you know what you can get like if you go to the mountain stream, you know, and you drink the the water there, you know, and you know what it does to you. I mean, it can really mess you up and dehydrate you. And all those things. There's a lot of them, really, but, but those are some of the most common. And so we understand that before we eat a meal, you know, we need to wash our hands because we might have some of this stuff on there. And, you know, we use forks and spoons and things like that, so it's probably most of the time, but, but you know, so that helps a little bit. But, you know, the bread, I mean, you know. But anyway. <laughs> So what I want you to understand is, you know, it's important for us to clean up before we eat. It's also important for us to make sure we're clean before we observe this meal. It's a different kind of clean we're talking about here. You know, um, this time of consecration, it's a time to make sure our hearts are clean. You know, it's one thing to have your hands clean, but it's a completely uh, different thing to have your heart clean. And, and uh, that's why... He says in verse 28, let a person examine himself and then drink the cup and, and eat the bread. Um, and he gives some warnings here. Um, you know, the first warning, he says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. And so we really need to examine ourselves. And, you know, I, I'll just be honest with you. I don't know what all this means exactly. I mean, it's really kind of kind of hard to uh, to determine exactly what all this means. But, but he follows that by describing the judgment upon those who are pretending they are clean when they're not clean. And he says, you know, some have gotten ill and some have died and, and so on. So I know this. Uh, God doesn't like it when we pretend to be something or somebody we're not. That's one of the reasons we have this authentic uh, word in our core values is because God loves us in spite of our sin. We ought to love one another in spite of our sin. And you know, that's one thing we try to do. But we, we don't love people in their sin. We love people out of their sin. You understand? I think a lot, a lot of churches today you know, we, we want to love people who are hurting and who are, who are caught up in their sin, but we don't want to leave them in their sin. God calls us to come out of our sin. He's called us to repentance and faith. And, and even though maybe in, in, you know, in this life until we're complete, maybe we won't defeat all sin, but we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us to resist those things. And that's what God's called us to do. And so... <coughs> 
before we eat of this meal, before we observe the Lord's Supper, I hope you understand it's important for us um, to have an authentic walk with Jesus. You know, uh, you can walk in a room and you can you can act like you didn't do this or that, and you know, and and uh, you know, I may or may not know the truth, and it, it may not even matter, but. You might as well have an authentic walk with Jesus because He knows everything. He knows more about you than you know. He knows more about motives and thoughts and, and all those things. And when we eat it, or we come together to observe this meal, it's an opportunity for us to look inside each of us, to look at our own hearts and ask God to reveal those things in us that are unclean. And when He reveals those things, it's not a time for us to say, oh, well, that's just how I am. That's not what God wants us to do. God wants us to confess that sin and to turn away from it and follow Him. And that's what confession really means, you know, is to agree with God and, and to uh, turn away. And, and so 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, it's a time for us to say, and we ought to do this every day. It's a time maybe for us to collectively to come together and say, okay, Lord, have we sinned as a body of Christ? Do we need to confess something as the body, you know, and, and those kind of things. And so, to prepare, prepare this meal, though, you know, you can't really clean yourself. You can wash your own hands, but you can't clean your heart. That's a job. That's a job only Christ can do. And so you got to go to the Father and the work of the Son. That'll do the cleansing. And so a lot of times we rush to the Lord's table without much thought, like we said, and without a lot of spiritual preparation. And I want to I tell you, don't do that. You know, we've got to confess our sins and plead for God's forgiveness. And, and it's also a time for us to forgive others. You know, maybe there's somebody that we need to go to and say, hey, I'm sorry. I'm, Will you forgive me and restore a relationship between brothers and sisters? Or maybe you need to go to someone and say, Hey, will you forgive me? I know I've hurt you or I've, I've done this or that and, and, and I, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I, I need you to forgive me. And I want to heal this relationship. And so it's a time for us to get right with God and a time for us to get right with our brothers and sisters. That's one of the things that we're called to do when we come together. And so it's a time of commemoration, and it's a time of consecration. But this meal is also, it's a time for celebration. You know, in, in verse 26, he, Paul writes, As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And so, really, this is, a, this is a, 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 the gospel in a sense, isn't it? Every time we observe the, the meal, we're proclaiming the gospel. Uh, you know, the righteousness of Christ, the suffering, uh, His death, and His resurrection. Uh, because, and it involves, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times when we have Lord's Supper, it's always sort of somber, you know, and kind of a funeral atmosphere. But when we leave, at this church, when the Lord's Supper is over, we leave jubilant, don't we? Because we sing, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it because we've got something to look forward to. It's a time of celebration. I mean, you know, it ought to, there ought to be some sorrow and grief when we observe because we're going to be sorrowful over our sin and grieving over the fact that Christ had to shed His blood for us. But the point is missed if we only focus on that. That, you know, when we, when we do that and that's all we focus on, we see Christ crucified, but we don't see Him resurrected. <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, we see Him defeated instead of reigning. And so we need to remember that Christ, the one who voluntarily laid down His life for us and took on the wrath of God for our sin, defeated sin, death, and the grave, and He's alive. And He says that when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim His death until He comes. And He's coming because He's not dead. 
Uh, he's alive, and, and we need to remember that. And so, uh, we, you know, we need to approach the meal with deep reverence and a solemn reflection on his death. But at the same time, there ought to be some celebration over the glorious victory over sin and the gift of God's grace and our salvation and the, the reunion that's going to take place. There ought to be some celebrating, you know? And, and so that's what he says, proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. A reason to celebrate. You know, when, when Christ died and He was placed in the tomb, the disciples were all distraught, but, but you know, and, and, and they thought it was over. You know, we remember we just preached on Easter about you know, them thinking it was over. And I, I remember in 1991, Tennessee, uh, the Tennessee football team went to Notre Dame to play football. And uh, I remember I was bummed because I had to work that day. And it was in the middle of the day. and, and uh, But I had the VCR running, you know, trying to record it and, and I, so I could watch it later. Yes. And so, so I, I was trying to avoid all contact with anybody who might tell me the score, you know, and that kind of thing. And, and I don't remember if it, I guess it was a, a break uh, uh, in the afternoon. Uh, I heard, you know, that right before halftime, Tennessee was down 31 to 7. You know what my first thought was? This game's over. You know, it's over. You know, and, and I, that bummed me out even more. I thought, well, now I don't even know if I'm going to watch it when I get home. You know, might as well forget that. I like tape over it, right? But. It didn't end badly. It ended, ended in celebration because Tennessee came back to win that game 35 to 34 in one of college football's biggest comebacks, you know? And, and uh, you know, winning's fun, isn't it? Losing's not fun. I mean, you know, uh, but win, winning's fun. And when, when you win, there's almost always some kind of celebration, isn't there? I mean, you know, when you win something, it, you know, even if it's just a woo, you know, I mean, that, you know, I won five dollars, you know, I mean, whatever, uh, you know, there's almost always some kind of celebration. Ooh, I got that parking place I wanted, you know, I mean, there's there's a celebration, and, and so, listen, a lot of times we blow them up and we celebrate after huge events. Christ was dead, you know. Thought to be defeated. All of his followers were grieved and acting as if there was no hope. But wait just a minute. No, wait a minute. Wait almost three days. <laughs> because the smell of victory is in the air. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And Christ arose. Hallelujah! Christ arose. And, and, and we can have victory over death because of Him. Just like He promised, Christ defeated sin for us. He put death to death for us, right? And He lives so that we can experience that victory now and forever in His presence in eternity. And that ought to excite us. When we think about that, when we observe this meal, there ought to be a point uh, when we get excited because Christ loved us enough uh, to do that for us, and He's alive, and He says we do it, proclaiming His death until He comes. And we ought to get excited because of that. Because He's coming. He's coming, you know. And, and uh, there's going to be a time until He... This is a foreshadowing of the marriage supper of the Lamb. That time when all believers will sit at the Lord's table in His presence. You know, and so a part of this meal is a reminder of Christ's victory and, and our salvation. And, and so we can celebrate. We can look forward to that day, you know, when we're going to sit down at the Lord's table with Him and all those who've gone before us. And, you know, that's something to get excited about. Just think about it. Oh, man. And so this morning, as, as we think about this, you know, um, I want to share one more little story with you as we, we prepare for a time of response. But I heard this story about uh, this ship that was pulling in uh, to shore. Uh, it was full of soldiers, and uh, they'd been gone to war. And the captain, as they were pulling in on the ship, the captain had his uh, binoculars, and, and he was looking to the shoreline, and he, he was seeing some of the men's wives, you know, that were there jumping and, you know, uh, eager to 
see their husbands and one man in particular, one soldier, he kept waiting for the captain to call his wife's name and uh, and he never did. And, and when the soldiers all disembarked and they headed down, he looked around and finally he found his wife back there in the back, just just standing and and um, you know kind of, you know he walked over to her you know a bit of a sullen expression and she asked him says why are you so sad and he said well the captain saw all the other men's wives waving and eagerly fighting forward in the crowd trying to meet their husbands and he called out you know these soldiers names but he never saw you and she said, but I was here, I was, I was back here in the back just waiting for you, you know. And, and uh, he said, yeah, but all the other wives were standing and eagerly waving and watching. And so, when, you know, what I want you to see is, you know, you may be waiting for Christ's return. You know, he may even scare you. But are you eagerly anticipating that? Are you waving? Are you, can you say, even so, come Lord Jesus? You know, and, and that's part of what we're doing when we observe the Lord's Supper is, is we're watching and looking forward to the completion of the church, the return of Christ, you know, the coming of the groom. You know? So these are a few things to think about, you know, commemoration. Consecration and celebration. <sighs> Commemoration, remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Consecration, make sure your heart is right with God. And celebration, rejoice in the Lord's salvation. Rejoice. You know? And before we eat, I want to give you an opportunity to respond today. I know, you know, some of you today, I, you, I know you're, you're probably convicted over your sins. You may have never even given your heart and life to Jesus and received His Spirit and, 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 and you're dead in trespasses and sins. And, and if that's the case, then you know, right now is the right time to do that. Right now is the right time to give your heart and life to Jesus. So, when we sing, you know, if you've got any doubt about that relationship with Jesus, then right now is the time to get it right. So we want to ask you just to step out of your seats and make your way down here and uh, come and come and talk to me or maybe uh, you know some other counselors that we have available here, hopefully. And 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 you know, but we're here to pray with you and help you, okay? And so right now, you know. As we begin to sing, just make your way down. <coughs> Maybe you're here and you know you're you're certain about your relationship with Jesus, but but you've got some unconfessed sin. So right now may be the time for you to do that. Just confess that sin before God. Take that. Take a moment and do that. Maybe you need to approach somebody here and say, "Hey, forgive me," or "Will you forgive me?" And let's heal that relationship. Let's bond together. Right now, if the Holy Spirit will lead you. Right now. Come on. Let's get our hearts and minds ready to worship King Jesus at His table. Father, we give this time to You. Thank You for Your love and Your sacrifice for us. We ask it in Jesus' name, Lord. You have Your way right now. Amen. Come on, let's stand together. If God's speaking to your heart, come on as we sing this morning.